we won't age ourselves. No, we won't. Yes, Bye. not today, darling. But we've been sisters for so many years, and we've mm-hmm. been in each other's lives for everything. Birth of everything. our children, graduation from college, and then her dad, this amazing man, Dr. Ghazi, um, was instrumental in helping my kids learn karate, uh, martial arts, acting, all kinds of things. So these are um, fixtures that have been in our life and part of our village for a long time. So having you on the show to talk about what you do for the community is like an honor for, for both of us. Yes. We know that all of our Northwest Catholic family is watching and oh. on Facebook, <laughs> and hopefully in the chat. So when you see me looking down, I'm looking at the chat because I'm sure people want to ask questions and such. So why don't you guys tell me a little bit about yourselves before we dive into your organization? To start with you, Dr. Ghazi. But individually, uh, our organization. <laughs> However you would like to, whatever well, you, you feel. Well, I just, to tell a little bit about myself, I um been involved in, in social service for so many years, I lose count. But I, I give credit to at least 38 uh, years being involved. And uh, I started off in this field as a group counselor for but he called it back in the day, juvenile, young men, boys. Mm-hmm. And sort of graduated and went and received degrees and so forth. But the mm-hmm. thing with me is that I didn't want to get into this field. My intention was to go into business oh. in my early college years. But uh, I did something that I didn't expect to receive an answer to. I, as I was working one uh, year, and I'm gonna share this story quickly, uh, mm-hmm. going a, as a parking lot attendant, St. Francis Hospital. Mm-hmm. I was so bored with that. And one day I gave a prayer, I said, no, ask God to uh, use me what the way you want to use me because I was wanting to do something that is useful to my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, three, days, uh, three days later, a man showed up in a blue van and asked me uh, my name, so forth and so on. Mm-hmm. But that, he asked me, have I ever worked with young men? I said, yeah, you don't know all along. And that, long story short, he asked me, to, do I want a job? I said, yes. So he told me about the home that he was running. I said, they have no idea what a group home is. So he did. I went to the group home, and I was working with these young men. Mm-hmm. We up with four young men in the household. After that, he ended up with 12 and more throughout the state. But anyway, that started my career. Okay. Wow. Went from there, I've been I've been martial artist. I always felt a way to mix martial arts with uh culture okay. and community environment. That's why I continue to make so to, for me, my daughter and I at Terrain, we was able to integrate martial arts principles with mental health. Yes. That's what we've been doing. Yes. Can you tell me why that's important? Like what are the, what is the the ideology behind? Yes. Uh, Why that's important. I'm I'm sorry, I missed it for a second. Uh, Why that's important because I learned a long time ago as my uh, experience in martial art, that martial art was, is, is a 50%, I'm sorry, 80% mental mm-hmm. training and there are 20 percent that's physical mm-hmm. and most of us don't understand that but i learned that long early age my martial art experience so i told to myself listen you were into counseling mm-hmm. i've been doing some counseling why don't we take the martial arts stuff which by the way she put it in martial art too as a child i don't think she had a choice of it but so you know <laughs> <laughs> she loved it <laughs> i didn't give her a choice my first thing asked for a choice she was so used to following me and doing, try to do everything I did. But <laughs> we took those two professions and we integrated them together and we came up in 2000, I think 2006, mm-hmm. Stephen Hartford gave us a grant wow. to, okay. during the summer, to work with young men, young boys in the public school system that were having problems, behavior problems. And we did mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And it was such a success. Mm-hmm. I said, no, nope, this is it. This is what we yeah. got to do. We got to reach out to those parents, grandparents, who have young men, young boys into the school system and mm-hmm. at home 
and we not understand what they're going through, we need to find a way to help them and also help the mothers and the grandmothers. Absolutely. We have about three grandmothers who had young boys that were growing up. Yeah. So that's how we got started with the concept of let's take martial arts as they live of us at, as a platform mm-hmm. to help our people in our community. Yes. Along with the mental health and life skills. Because martial arts teaches life skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how to, you know, that's how to get life skills, how to get along, how to do, how to, uh, you know, direct yourself and, uh, and and get along with other people and have build your 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 life into in the field of whatever field you're chosen to go into. So that's how we mix those two, and we continue. So that's where we are today. Uh, terrain uh, been along that journey all along as a child and as a young teenager to continue, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we are. Today. Yeah. Yeah. Apple did not fall, yeah, fall far, did it, Terrain? It, and you know what, Naima, it did not. But I have, to, I'm listening to his story, and I'm sitting here saying, I, I kind of, I was a little resistant because I also wanted to go into um, business, or my first goal was business or biology, science, and mm-hmm. I did very well in the in, in the science, but it was something that, um, I guess pushed me to go into the, the human service part of it. And mm-hmm. I ended up doing, I ended up graduating from Central Connecticut State University with a communications major with a um, psychology minor. And then went on to um, UConn and got my master's in social work. Yes. But in the beginning, I, I did not want to, I, I didn't want to do it. Cause I was like, you know, it was just, it was too much. But I, mm-hmm. I, I think because of what my father and what my mother, they were both very active in the community and the church. It was, it was just normal for me, I guess, to follow suit. And, you know, Absolutely. and that's where I am now. And as my father said, I, I did the martial arts, trained in it for years, competed, um, and was very excited about it, but ended up retiring maybe with the martial art piece of the physical part, maybe mm-hmm. about, uh, actually, yeah, 10, 10 years ago, I, I retired, wow. hung in the, 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 my, my gloves and feet, and now just doing a little teaching, but also uh, focusing on the mental health piece of it. Yes. Absolutely. So how does um, the principle of martial art, how does it help with um, the the aggression that's sometimes associated with mental health issues in children? How do they come together? Does it, is it like it helps them work out that mental stress and anxiety through the physical activity? Like how do you guys teach the principles? So let me just say this before I answer that. One of the things that a lot of folks think that um, martial arts is it's just kicking and it's just punching, right? They mm-hmm. think that it's an aggressive sport. And mm-hmm. yes, it is a physical sport. Mm-hmm. However, we one of the things that we do with our um, students is that we teach them how to how to use their minds, yeah. how to use how to have control over their bodies, and then after that we start teaching them the physical part the, the punch the kick the competing but we, right. we want them to get in tune with themselves and being able to identify how they're feeling um what's yeah. going on with them and being able to articulate that because yeah. what we've learned was that you know you know children they, they just react you know they're going through mm-hmm. trauma they're going through depression they're going through anxiety they're not mm-hmm. able to say um i'm feeling anxious i'm feeling nervous i'm feeling sad react by the behavior right and so right. we've learned to ha- how we've been training um actually but we've we've learned to identify how we can teach the kids how to say i'm feeling sad today yeah. you know I- yeah. i'm feeling a little uneased today be okay mm-hmm. with that yes oh that's awesome do you find that these kids sorry go ahead mom um I, you know martial arts is about discipline um and I, and I think they're so very important, particularly with uh, youth of today. Many of them don't get, um, either they're not getting the, the discipline at home or they're not getting the proper type of discipline. Um, but I wonder how, what makes your program successful um, beyond just the discipline? I mean, how do I, I want to ask this question? You're, you're working on the mental health piece and you're using the discipline and the um, principles of martial arts. Do you think that that makes your program unique as opposed to someone just going to a dogo and, and having some martial arts or somebody that's say, you know, a therapist weekly or a couple of times a month? How does the merging of those two areas 
um, make your program unique. And what is the name of your program, your, your business? So the name of our organization is called Build a Better You Family Services. However, our martial arts piece, which is an umbrella of um, Build a Better You, is called Gazido Karate Academy. And what makes our organization a little different is that, you know, our principles is um, we teach African principles. Okay, we mm -hmm. we help kids identify. Most of our a lot of our kids are black and brown. We do get some, you know, other um, races that come into our um, martial arts facility, but most are mm -hmm. black and brown because we're located in the inner city of of Hartford, and. So so with teaching them about themselves and their culture, it kind of now they can identify with something. You know what I'm saying? So if you increase, if you if you teach a person yeah. about all the great things that their ancestors has yes. has done, and then yes. you say this can be you, it, it builds their self esteem. And now yeah. they want to know how how can I be like that? How can I do that? So that's yeah. what makes us different in one aspect. And the other mm -hmm. aspect is that we have combined the mental health piece of it. Uh, one second, what happened, guys? I think. His phone went out, so he's he's coming okay. in here, sneaking in here with me. Good. Um, yep. Yeah, I don't know if he's better. <laughs> so what makes us different is that one we we think about the culture because we understand the culture. Mm -hmm. Um, his my father's principle um, is based on Swahili. Um, mm -hmm. We teach them, you know, how to count in Swahili, how to, uh, about animals in Swahili, and then we focus on again, like I said, the mental health. Most yeah. people aren't they, they're not focusing on it. they're not they're not understanding that it, it goes hand in hand. Um, right. One of, the, one of the questions that they ask is how is our organization different um, mm -hmm. from any other martial arts organization? Okay. Uh, good question. I'm sorry to hear. Uh, sorry about that technical part. Okay. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I've learned over the years in my career with martial arts, maybe earlier, that it was a mental health. Um, the mental health with mental health, and and mixing it, mental health and as as standard traditional mental health uh, program or services um, didn't answer uh, the full person as a black or brown person, culturally, uh, as a martial artist, it did not offer me the cultural appearance. Yeah. So combining them, well, it's the same, actually. Martial mm -hmm. art was a big to bring younger people to something that they knew about, know about, mm -hmm. and have an interest in. Then we take the mental health part to begin to help them to understand and deal with the emotion where uh, maybe anxiety or, you know, depression, whatever yes. they're going through in terms of mental health, yeah. but to deal with that. Yeah. And in a slow type of process, because our family, black people, we have been taught over the years that to be embarrassed by mental health. Yes, that's a take stigma. It as you know, we don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so we, it was easy to make a transition. Because Marshall, sure they knew, understood it, and they all, but they see it as uh, a way to control or uh, discipline. Okay. Right. Yes. But they don't know what it takes to discipline a child, a person. So discipline is something you just learn to do. It's a process. Mm -hmm. Right. And self-esteem. Mm -hmm. What did that mean? Most people mm -hmm. don't know what that means. But what caused mm -hmm. a person to be, uh, a child to be bullied? Mm -hmm. Allow them to be bullied. What caused a person to let uh, uh, himself to be, uh, become a bully? Or right. Abusers, okay? right. All those issues you deal with in the martial art yeah. of learning. Yeah. So that is one way to make it clearly Martial would be a vehicle to draw them in. And the mental health part is a way to just bring them in and continue to do what we normally do in martial Absolutely. You know, but I also want to add, too, that we not only um, provide martial arts here at our agency, we, mm -hmm. we provide a culture center here. We offer African dancing, African drumming, hip-hop dancing. Um, we've had, um, let's say, drama already. Drama. Drama. Um, so we use the arts, yoga. yoga. We use the arts yeah. to be able to engage with our families, not just the kids, but the entire right. family. Right. Mm -hmm. The holistic approach. That's awesome. And the thing with what we're trying to say to you is this. 
throughout my career, I always felt myself observing our people and all the traditional service agency. And I always felt that we have been underserved, not mm-hmm. intentionally in some, some cases, but yeah, but <laughs> not intentionally at most time, but because that's not what we, that's not, they don't understand us. See, they don't understand what it takes to be a black person growing up in America, mm-hmm. Earth, mm-hmm. the grade. Our experience is unique being any other people on the planet Earth, our experience in America. Yes. So, but that comes with certain culture, mm-hmm. certain, um, well, mental health, things that we as black folk understand among each other. Right. But we have to make sure that the general public understand that. And so mm-hmm. we've got to be able to work with us first. Mm-hmm. But when I tell people in the community, listen, don't be ashamed. I never use mental health. I say to you, you probably dealing with some anxiety or you know, or depression. Mm-hmm. Those are things that people can identify with. So right. That would get them thinking, okay, I'm okay. And there's nothing wrong with you. Nothing happened to you. Right. You're normalizing it. Statement. Yeah. Right. That's a mm-hmm. deep statement I just made. So yeah. Yeah. But I get up people understand. Now the general public. In the traditional, I call it a Freudian type of uh, mental health, mm-hmm. don't necessarily, doesn't necessarily address our need in the fullest mm-hmm. sense as a whole person. No. I don't yeah. to do that. You've mm-hmm. got to understand, I got to feel what you're going through. Right. I got to right. sense that. See? Right. And right. I, I haven't lived it. I'm not quite <laughs> maybe, maybe sympathetic to you and, and that, but I don't really understand. I'm going to go back to my learned behavior that society had put on me. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. there's a rule, and every everything you do is a rule. So I, that's mm-hmm. the point. So we know what the rules are. We know what the problems are. That's mm-hmm. making the big yeah. so, so let me ask I'll you something. On. When you had, you guys both had your pilgrimage back to the motherland, did that solidify your calling in indoctrinating African teachings in your principle of, of your methodology for the, for the children? Bringing those pearls back from <laughs> Africa. Thank you for asking that question. That's just a good question. Um, for me, yes. Mm-hmm. See, for me, it goes back, and it's a good story. But uh, for me, I've always been in search uh, for my, my African connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a child, as a mm. so, wow, yeah, as a child, and I give credit to my grandmother. All right, <laughs> I was wondering where that came from. Like, who taught you to be proud but as a child? See, Amen. She taught, yeah, absolutely. Amen. Planted a seed in me as yes. a child. So anyway, that she can see continue to grow because the seed was a seed of curiosity. You know uh, what she meant. She wouldn't tell me the full story. So when I went to I first came to Africa. I, I was on the dream to go uh, to other places, and the place I could get to at the time when I was a teenager. Uh, I went to Europe uh, in high school, and that also broadened my view of myself uh, at age seventeen. Or something. And after that, I uh, jumped. I went to Haiti. Oh wow! And I, I was driven to Haiti, and didn't know why I was driven to Haiti, but. Uh, a journey took me there, and I learned so much when I was there. And and, and then after that, um, I was driven to the motherland. And I've always felt this tendency of fear and, and pull. I think. And that's when I went to the motherland, and I first went by myself. And I, uh, what's up? What, I didn't see, I didn't go there to as a vacation. I went yeah. to learn. <laughs> and to, yeah. Yeah, really. To all the places I went to, I went there to get to know the people, to feel the spirituality of the people. Right. About, and that's what my journey was about. And when I went there, I said, "Okay, this is it." And I, I was determined to make sure that I take some of my students. I go to that. I want them to understand and get that feeling. That. And that's when Rain came along and other students of mine took mm-hmm. them there. And so, and to see the dynamics. Between their understanding of who they were and the African, the Native Africans, 
uh, which you know the uh, whole um, interaction between the two was amazing. Mm. And, and, and I tell you this so real shortly. Uh, and I saw the connection there. Rain got in a in a uh, a cell uh, debate with a young lady sister. Oh, and really? a, and a, over she's a jury, I think. Sure. Jury. And okay. that may sound like something minor, but this negotiating and this exchange of the both of them that they went through. Mm-hmm. I saw all different levels of taking place there. I stood back and watched that. And at that time of the day and after y'all, you know, so hot, after lunchtime, we had to sit back and we mostly got to sit back on the uh, uh, on the shade tree and watch this whole uh, this thing going on. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty hot. It took about two hours. <laughs> Over oh, one item, I think it was a pair of earrings. It was, it was jewelry. <laughs> no, it was, not, it was jewelry. It was the clothing. We were, we were going back and forth. What the, do you think this should be a fair price? Or no, back back and forth. She would go in her corner. I would go in my corner and come back. <laughs> and eventually we came to a fair price. We walked away, you know, happy. But yeah. But, 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 you said, but before that, Mm-hmm. They both had the good backup. Yeah, I she got her back backup. Up, she got her backup. Back back <laughs> for lunch, right? Go for lunch. This, this, you know, this, this, two, uh, this two dynamics have gone, and they broke down in tears. Oh, the two of them, and that that connection came. Yeah, the connection. Yes, That's what I'm talking about. Yes. And look at that, negotiating was already entra- ingrained in you because of your African-ness already. Mm-hmm. And that is very African to negotiate. That's what, that's what we do. That's what, what we do. do. You know? Wow. Yeah, so at, at, along about, I'm going to take my time in it, but yeah, that's how it did. It did, uh, you know, certified that for me in you know, over the years. Mm-hmm. And, and we do that. that's why we, now we're here. And, uh, yes. Yes. Now, my, uh, you know, last 30 years, we celebrated my uh, third year in the martial art. Uh, 2019, right before the pand- pandemic, and that, at that point in time, I kind of handled the lead to terrain. Now we need to do or emphasis uh, toward the mental health. Um, although she thinks she are totally in charge of, <laughs> <laughs> but, but she's doing what she's supposed to do at that point in time. I hope so. And too. it's good for me. I want to let me sit down a little more, you know. <laughs> but uh, it, it'll get to that point. But the point is that um, that's where uh, the journey. I'm from, and that's where the journey has us to where we are today, and, yes. and uh, continue. And it's just not over yet. Yeah, well, absolutely. I think our, our biggest challenge right now, and probably uh, also, is to be able to uh, to let our people know. See, I, I'm unapologetically black, and I don't. You know, I'm not apologizing for anybody. You know, um, that we need to help our people. We need to service them. Mm-hmm. We need to let them know because we know what you're going through. Like I said earlier, we know where you are. We know where you've been. We've been there too. And we still are there. So yes. we talk about education, or oh, that's another piece of mine. We can give that. That's, that's another piece. But mental health, education, you know, economics, we need to know. We need to be helping each other on those areas. And those areas of profession, uh, you know, area of uh, um, yeah. you know, We need to be there. Yeah. Absolutely. We need to do more. And you guys are trailblazing Absolutely. through that. Mom, you're on mute. I just wanted to let you know. I'm going to um, read a couple of things in the chat because we have an interactive show. Lots of people talking about what you guys are doing. So um, DJ Gaddafi says, so have you taken the Japanese aspects out of it and made it more relevant? African, you, for example, you like counting in Swahili rather than Japanese. Is Was that something that you? Good question. Person? Thank you very much for asking that question. Whoever asked it, yes, I did, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I couldn't wait to do that. Uh, yeah, okay. the March art. I think you're referring to the March art, right? Yes. So yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, I stumbled on to history when I would think back for a second to answer the question properly. But I was looking for. I had been in martial art for many many years. I think maybe 16 years before that, and different styles of martial art system like uh Asian, I mean uh, uh two type Chinese martial art, uh Japanese martial art, Korean martial art, and some African martial art. So like five different systems. And I noticed that martial art was always built on the culture. 
mm-hmm. of the country that was coming from. Okay. And I looked around, I couldn't find any of them that identified me. Oh. I was looking for me. Okay. And again, looking for myself. And <laughs> that's another story. Do I do? So I looked for myself and I said, well, okay, it got to be something there. I already knew then that we were the first people on planet Earth. We were the first people here. Yes. Why everything is, you know, include me in it. So I did my research. Why I um, decided to look away and start my own organization. And I uh, down at Yale University, uh, done some research by how to And I came across the old pictures of martial arts figures uh, in the rock dating back 37,000 years ago. I said, whoa. Wow. That's on time. So other um, other ages, other people at that time wasn't around. Mm-hmm. Well, you didn't know that. I said, oh, wait, 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 mm-hmm. around there. Easy. More trust started growing time blue black. Mm-hmm. It's proof of it. And that's where I got that. And that's, after that point, maybe I'm so short. I went, I went back and said, okay, this is gonna be Afrocentric. Yes. Black folk centric. And I want to teach know. that to our kids. <laughs> so you know who you are. And, uh, yes. and as time went by, and of course, my colleague at the time, I was crazy, you know, what's going to do? Oh, no, no. I'm going to buy that. Okay. Sometimes that's that. how it is. Mm-hmm. So that's, yeah, I took it out and I uh, put the Af- African uh, piece in it with the language. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kiswahili was probably the most um, widely spoken language in Africa on the continent at the time. And today it's even more so because yeah. it's probably spoken um, half, half of the country. Too. And he's going on. In fact, uh, Swahili is now, as uh, some scholars and, uh, and intellectuals saying that it will become the number one speak, uh, language for African people all over. Yeah. Oh, wow. Everybody's going to pan African. All of us speak you know, mm-hmm. our language <clears throat> to that country. Okay. Awesome. I'm not surprised being that Nairobi is such a huge city. It's like mm-hmm. bigger than most of the cities here in this country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm not surprised. Absolutely. Wow. So we have a couple other things in the chat. Um, Faith says, um, I like the fact that you have incorporated the mental health component since for too long we have been conditioned to ignore it. Uh, Simia says the same thing. She loves the cultural component as well. And yeah, so lots of great feedback. So are your programs at capacity? Well, actually, before we go there, what did you guys do during the pandemic? Did you have virtual classes how were you able to service the community so we we had a combination of both we did have okay. virtue for those folks that were not comfortable with coming in and then mm-hmm. we also had small classes um with for those who needed that interaction because as you know during the pandemic a lot of folks felt isolated um and a lot of depression started to um they start to feel depressed more. Yeah. So we had them to come in and um, we just, we never stopped. We did, we kept going. A lot of their anxiety was increased, it was heightened. So we had them come up, come in and we taught them different ways to be able to manage that anxiety and the depression on while they're home, but coming in here to get that socialization because yes. it, it was definitely needed, definitely needed. Not only for our, our adults, but also for our youth as well. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm That's glad they still had you as a <laughs> continuous outlet. Yeah. 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 You yeah. mentioned adults, and I was going to ask you, because I was thinking all along that the, your programming was um, geared to children. I was wondering that if during the pandemic, and even before that, um, are you able to draw in the adults, the parents of these children? I mean, is that part of the process when you find that there are um, issues uh, and you can tell that there's something that's happening in the home that's affecting these children as you see them um, at your center. Do you have the occasion to then have uh, conferences with their parents? Are you uh, guiding them as well? Absolutely. Uh, let me ask an important question. Um, I have been doing it a lot. It was all my career. Mm-hmm. Because I knew that, I always believe that our children are shadow of us. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is, yeah. what I, I always tell the parent when they bring the kids to me is, listen, hey, bring Jenny to me. Okay, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna ask you this question. I'm not trying to get your personal life. 
But I need to know, you have to get, I don't need all the details. What's happening to you? What's going on with you, mom? Oh, nothing good. <laughs> yeah. I know. We say that so fast, don't we? Yeah, nothing wrong with you. It's a child. Yeah. All right. So what I tell them is most time children are reflecting what they see in here yeah. in the home mm-hmm. or out in public with their parents. And yeah. people forget sometimes. They sometimes forget. Young one, you are the first teacher and you're the only teacher. Yes. yes. And you'll be the last teacher. Amen. Last. That's the truth. Okay? Mm-hmm. So what you do, yeah, they're going to emanate. So be careful what you say or what you do in their presence. Yes, and, that was my mom's it, philosophy for me. Absolutely. That was her. Yeah, yeah. so I do, and, I, and I've been, uh, I went to schools, uh, for public school uh, with parents and mothers, mm-hmm. and I, I try to, well, I said it before, I even heard this man, uh, Dr. Mark Johnson, never go to school alone by yourself as a single mother, okay? Uh, and and uh, don't sign anything if you don't know what you're signing. Uh, this is design that for that. To, uh, mm-hmm. Make it difficult for us, and it continues to perpetuate uh, this whole idea of um, inadequate human being that we we are. So yeah, I always talk to parents, and I always let parents know that you know, look at this, and, and I'm saying in a mean way, but I want them to you know, get the reality that you no, know, what you do is your is your child. Always repeat that. Even when I go to school with them, I say, "What well, you see, your child, that's you." Stop. Ah. Allowing the school, uh, it was in 1965, 64, we allow our kids to go and be teach and your mind be molded and shaped by people who don't like us. We continue to do that. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, I tell the parents, uh, let's look at what's going on and, and, and examine yourself. Take a look mm-hmm. at what's going on with you. And then we will you a better way of understanding what happened to your child. Yes. In school or what, out in the playground or whatever Yes. Can I ask you a question about respect? It's it's funny you mentioned back in the 60s. And um, obviously, Terrain and I weren't there yet, but we know that kids over time, our, you guys as our parents have told us that there has been a lack of respect, such a breakdown of respect with kids and adults in general. Do you face any of that same disrespect from these children that maybe you did not face in the early 2000s? What's changed in that scope or even in your entire career? Because, you know, children are hit with so much more now um, information highways that we don't necessarily want them to be traveling on. So how do you, how does, how is that? Are you yeah. able to, to garner their respect quickly? <clears throat> well, ask the question first time. What happened? Mm-hmm. One second, guys. We... <laughs> Our technology is not. There we go. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, respect. Yes. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I, I share with Dwayne all the time is sometimes we bump head on this. Um, and back in the day, you know, I, I grew up as a child in, uh, you know, in, in Egypt and so, so forth. But even back then, coming from Mississippi, I'm from the Delta. Lose down in Mississippi, you know, we were very, parents were very, very strict on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't speak, child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but I think what happened uh, from my, I remember in my perspective is that society began to change the rules for us. And one of the rules they changed was uh, you don't have to call a grown person. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, other people took that and said, well, you can call me Jerry. Or you can call me Betty. When black folks say, saying, you call me Miss, you say Miss Betty or Miss Johnson or Mr. John. They used that, kept that, that little title <clears throat> in place because that separated the adult from the child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and something as minor as that, seems like it's minor, but it's not. It's a big difference. So mm-hmm. I would never call my mother by her name. Mm-hmm. Don't call your, you call by the title. What title she was you call her by? And even adults. 
Even to this day, I still address people as Mr. and Miss. Yes. And that is the, I think, is the first. Because words are powerful. And, and, and what you say is that uh, uh, how you address it is going to set the tone, the mental tone, and the spiritual tone as your, with your relationship with that person. Mm-hmm. See? So if I go around calling all grown people, older people, hey, Jerry, hi, Miss, hi, hi John, then that can tell me, okay, you know, I'm on an equal plane with that person. Right. Absolutely. So that's what it is. Exactly. That's when the disrespect come in at. Yes. Okay. Yes, See? yes, yes. So that kind of thing is stuff. Mm-hmm. Part of that is uh, we have to take some of that responsibility for assimilating to that mm-hmm. culture. Okay. And yes, it's so true. There's a lot of disrespect. Actually, there's very little respect for, um, for their own parents. Uh, I mean, they created nursing homes to mm-hmm. get rid of their parents. Is that we do that. Exactly. We brought, we kept our our elders in at home with us. Absolutely. They shipped their elders out, and that that kind of thing bring, is the difference in our cultures. Mm-hmm. And you know the fact that they disregard um, that that respect that's due to your elders. We're gonna start assimilating to that too, instead Absolutely. of st- staying strictly to our African traditions and culture that we brought here exactly. when we were enslaved. Um, we started becoming more like them. And as we did, we started losing our humanity and losing our dignity and losing the respect that we have for our elders. Absolutely. And that's why we got what we got now. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Let me um, talk about what's going on in the chat. So Scott says, I think the respect was lost because of the connection from parent to child has been severed by technology. That's huge. Kids are in another world in their rooms away from their parents. You know, when my kids were little, they couldn't have um, their, they had stuff out then. They had iPads and stuff, but my kids couldn't have it until they were teenagers just so I could keep talking to them. (laughs) And so they would be able to go outside and play and I wouldn't have to force them to have that uh, so-called some allotted, uh, what do you call it? Allotted time. Allotted time. Yes. Thank you. It is a, so, I mean, I didn't want to be able, I didn't, I knew I was going to lose when it came to a device. So I just said no devices until you guys are, you know, 13, 14. So that's how I did it, but it's harder now, even in the last 10 years. It's not even just with, um, just with the adults. It's just with them socializing period. They don't know how to socialize anymore because they're so wrapped up in some of their electronics. And when you, yeah. you find, when you take that away, you get, so they, oh my they, god it's like a detox like they it's like they withdraw <laughs> from the technology it is it's that it is it's something that we, we try to focus on here because i told my dad maybe a few years ago when i when the technology just really started coming with the, the tablets and all that i was like this is not good it takes away socials and people are not even making eye contact anymore because they're so wrapped up into what's going on on their telephones and in their tablets they yeah. forget how to have a conversation they yes. forget how to have fun they forget how to engage i remember growing up the fun was outside you know you're outside. outside now you try to push them outside and it's like they don't want to go they happy to be indoors <laughs> yes i'm cold i'm hot <laughs> right so but let me uh one comment i would have on that is and i'll say this that see we didn't just get here overnight and i think yeah. black folks need to understand that we in a system that had plans for us for a long time and they put it in motion uh what four thousand years ago some people five thousand i'm not sorry uh hundred years ago four hundred years ago and it is pumped it up so everything that we come to know all our culture from african culture to moments uh we were forced to erase it from our mind erase it from our behavior we do this, but even with that force during enslavement time, we still managed to bring a lot of African culture with us. Mm. We brought in our churches. Mm-hmm. We brought it in as in, in uh, our home teaching. We brought a lot of that culture with us that we continue. Mm-hmm. But I think what happened uh, going forward is that the technology we had TVs and radio and stuff still maintain that connection between adult. Yeah. And child. Yes. Uh, we had it in the churches. We everywhere. It's our culture. Yeah. But we allow when techno when 
I would say, when the controlling group in this country, in this world, figure out a way that they can make more money mm-hmm. of allowing us to do mm-hmm. something in the entertainment field, mm-hmm. the sky's there where well, you can make the money for you can start. Then. And that's, they paid them good money. And they, caught, and they knew that they would catch, capture the attention of the young people. Mm-hmm. This started back in the late 80s and early 90s. Mm. You call it gangster rap stuff coming out. So that's, it's, a, it's this increase that level of respect, except respect, first of all. It took that away from you, and you had to drown them. So now we weren't aware of this, both of us. But after a while, it sees kids begin to do. Going back to the same old thing. So TV, videos, all those uh, those that technology begin to work at us and we weaponize. They weaponize everything. Weaponized. So they wow. can use that. Okay? They weaponize everything. I'm gonna say this to you too. They weaponize religion. Oh, for it's sure. Absolutely. Yes, when the like, most powerful weapon they put on. <laughs> you know that's that's absolutely right. Absolutely. absolutely. So, but, you know, and these are things that happen. So gradually, gradually mm-hmm. as the technology energy increased, mm-hmm. so the better it became, the more it, it more effective it became mm-hmm. against us and yeah. dehumanizing our children, you know, mm-hmm. despiritualizing wow. them. Okay? And so you look at your mom, your mother, you don't care. Backtrack a bit. Had a young man at the pandemic had the audacity to slap his mother. To slap? Yes. Yeah. Hit his mother. Black? We don't do that. I, whoa, I don't hurt this number. This is kind of stuff. You know, back in our day, that kid would have been waking up in the middle of next week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, to me, absolutely. if he wakes up at all. <laughs> you know, but I work in, parents are getting hit you. by their kids a lot. I mean, Tareen, you know that. I have parents who are getting hit by their kids all the time. All the time. Yeah. You know, and the I disrespect, mean. telling their parents, you shut up. You, you shut up. I, I remember a day when your oh. m- my mother and my father would give me a look. And yeah. you know that so, I need to be quiet. You know, I need to yes. sit down. But it was all I give my son the same look. And he asked me, what you looking at me like that? <laughs> you know, so, because they don't, they don't get that, you know, they, yeah. they don't get that connection. Yeah, yeah it's not the same. But, uh, no. but we got to go back. And again, mm-hmm. uh, I agree. keep in mind that these things are voluntarily. We do things to please the controlling population in the country. Uh, mm-hmm. We got to step away from that now. Now we're in a new age, new mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. We gotta reach back, and we can save a lot of our. Uh, we gotta do, we gotta do it. I love that So we gotta go back, and, and we gotta go back, and, and first of all, step back and get ourselves collectively uh, right first. That's why I, I'm so important. It's so important to have these other people offer as a mental health service because I'm not just talking about mental health. I'm talking about the culture. I mix everything with culture. What is our culture? What is our background? What is our spiritual culture? How that all fits in? Uh, to our being as a human being. So people need to understand, we need to understand, we come to grips with Yes. We are, first of all, we, who we are, who are we? Right. Each individual look in the mirror, say, ask yourself, who am I? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it, it, it's so disturbing at times because, you know, as a teacher, I'm a teacher first, mm-hmm. trying to get information to our people and you, they don't, they're not, they don't get it. They don't get it. But, mm-hmm. I, you know, it used to frustrate me, but I came to understand that. Don't worry about that. Plant a seed. So, my grandmother came to one day and said, well, no, you know, you can't give it to me all the time. But all at once, plant a seed. Yeah. And hope it grows. And so even when you're doing people... stuff like this, mm-hmm. you have to go back. And I, and I and it came to me, uh, you the concept of a, a frog, putting a frog in hot water. So you give people too much one time, they're going to resist you and fight you. Actually, that's how they did this to us. It's right. a gradual process. In right. The, in the uh, media, in the technology, they gradually got out to the point where we don't want to to our mothers. We don't want to to our uh, father. 
Well, we don't think nothing about elder people. Mm -hmm. Nothing. We beat them up if we had to. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of dehumanizing. Right. Once again. Right. To take your spirituality from you and take your concept of who you think God is, the creator is, from you and put another example for another you. Another face on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Makes so much sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. Another face on it. And that's what happened to us. So the technology was, a, I think right now, is it, they speed it up. The price is yeah. to speed up that dehumanization. Oh. Of that's and now they got our children. Now, children, yeah. they know parents give their children, give the kids these technology. We think that's to occupy them, you know, you know be some time, some time. And a lot of us being single parent, you need a break yeah. once in a while. Got kids are so needy, they have a lot of need. So we can't be at 24 7 with them, come get to work, get a job, get a field, get to eat, the house. Yeah. So there's a lot of pressure on black mothers, mm -hmm. tremendous amount. Mm -hmm. And so we, you have to, so they knew that, they know this. That's why they would tell you back in the 70s, I'll give you some, I'll give you, uh, uh, we call food. Stamps and, and stamps. Oh. Said, but you can't have a man in your house. Mm -hmm. But you can't have a man in your house. Remember that. Do you remember, yeah. in order to get food stamps, you had to have a certain income, and they would come to your house to oh, see yeah. if your oh, husband or the father of the kids were living in that home. Oh, wow. And, right. and if he was living there, oh, wow. they cut you off the services. That's right. So that's when the disconnection yeah, from the family really started. Really and started. I was back in the early 70s. Wow. Yeah, and so then, wow. then you have the 80s when you have crack cocaine that came into the oh, families yes. in the household yeah. that destroyed us. So yes, it's been a, it's been a battle, battle. Yes. ongoing battle. Yes. Yeah. And then when you get into the mid and later 80s, when the war on drugs, you yes. know, implemented well, uh, <laughs> and took a, so many black men, particularly out of our families, for 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah. And like you said, Dr. Ghazi, it was, this was um, well planned and well implemented. Yes. And we Absolutely. were too busy, you know, trying to survive to see what was going on. And now that we know this, we have got to um, direct our knowledge to the children and make sure that we stop that pattern mm -hmm. that, that we've been living yeah. under all these years, you know, and that's yeah. the dealing with the kids and getting their heads out of these um, folks. So the poorest children walk around with iPhones. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Why is that? No. That why sense. is that? Mm -hmm. Why is it? Well, why does it make sense to you? Why is that? <laughs> So I'm going to go back in the chat before we continue. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. No, that's okay. So Jersey Girl says, what a child believes, what a child believes in is so critical today. How we act as guardians in helping um, mold their minds and beliefs is so important. Um, Jersey also says, technology didn't enter my house till I was in college. <laughs> uh, Riri says, I, she agrees with um, someone else in the chat, Scott, that technology is another babysitter, no boundaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Scott says, oh, uh, Jersey also says no one plays outside or board games anymore. I love that kind of stuff. I want to be mm -hmm. a kid again. I love going outside <laughs> to play. Um, Scott says, you are right about the plan. I say it, I say it all the time when people say the system quote unquote, the government is broken. It's not broken. It's working yeah. perfectly fine for how Absolutely. they find it. Mm -hmm. um, Riri says we have more younger parents that don't practice old school discipline. Oh yeah. She's a big <laughs> disciplinarian. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, yes. Let's see. Uh, one more. I'll just, two more comments and then we'll go on. Uh, Jersey says, that she would love to see children of today playing outside, riding bikes, enjoying double dutch, hey, walking to the corner store for candy, running to the ice cream truck, and just enjoying life. And I'm happy to say my kids do some of that now, even though they're older. Mm -hmm. And they definitely did when they were kids, little kids. Um, Scott says that we need to reacclimate our African culture, our children, and some adults have abdicated our, our cultural heritage through violent systematic assimilation into a bastardized European culture that is spiritually corrupt. Well, excuse me. Ashe. Ashe. Amen. Ashe did that. Ashe. 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 It is what it is. So and listen, you guys are with us for the last 10 minutes. We didn't expect. I, I'm just so happy that you guys are still here. And for the last 10 minutes, we were going to talk about child support. It's funny that, uh, Dr. Ghazi, you talked about men in the home, 
both of you guys talked about men in the home. So let's just segue into that. Unless there's anything else you wanted to mention about your program or where to, we, before we go, we can. We want to, we want to put a plug in where we, where we're located. If anyone is listening. Yes, please do the plug and then we'll continue, please. Yes. So we're located 60 Love Lane in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, you can reach us on our website, www.buildabetterullc.com. Again, that's www.buildabetterullc.com. Our telephone number is 860-310-5853. 860-310-5853. And again, that's Build a Better You Family Service. Okay, perfect. Got the website in the chat and the address. And if anybody needs more information, they know you can reach out to me, message me. Okay, thank you guys. So really quickly, let's get into child support for our last like eight minutes because at seven, we do have to go let our next DJ come on. So um, we know that child support is due, uh, especially to us young, um, well, black mothers, mothers of all races, single mothers and fathers who are raising their kids by themselves. We have to do that until age of 18. However, we know that it's not always just um, when we're talking about what a man or a woman should pay. Any thoughts on that? Any story any, that we're, we're, as far as we're talking about with child support? That's a whole new show. Right. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean for it to be a whole show. It's a whole show. Well, you're going to have to come back. Yeah, do, yeah, we'll do it again. But we can talk a, a little, little bit of that real quickly. Um, <laughs> child support... Child support, again, is very central. Uh, and, and you can see child support as, there's two entities here, uh, as money or as commitment. And, and, and mothers got to weigh that. I can't tell you what's important to you as a mom, because I don't know. So mm-hmm. now, if, 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 if the income is very important for you, then you need that income. Mm-hmm. If uh, support, having that company, and with that child, is more for you, then you use that. We right. got to wait that. And I think we, we did a bad job at it because we allowed the court to make those decisions for us. That's what I was going to say. Unfortunately. If, right. If you believe that if a father is taking care of his, his children every week or every month, giving the woman, the mother of his children support, <laughs> and she doesn't think it's enough and doesn't agree, then do you agree with her going to court if he's not paying yeah, enough? Absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Personally, as a man, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the point is I'm trying to get to is, uh, first, let me back up a second. We mm-hmm. gotta look at each other. Conditions. Yeah. What's happened with that father? Right. Now, I'm, it's not. A, I'm not saying it's an excuse. I'm saying to you, right. uh, Understand each other's trauma. Right. I we agree. gotta stare because mm-hmm. it, it's a trauma. It's a price. We talk about the, uh, the welfare system, what they did to us. So it's all. It's a cumulative process. But yeah. But she does deserve that. I mean, it, you know, that's just. A no-brainer. Yes. Now, if you can sit down with each other mm-hmm. and, and negotiate, mm-hmm. what can you do? I have no problem. I'm a father. Right. The other problem. If I didn't have the money, and the mother said, "Well, you know what? You know what? Come and babysit me." Okay, I'm there. That's mm-hmm. my contribution. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, that allow her to have more income coming in. If right. I don't have it, make up that. Right. Money. So yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. I can see and, that. And even more importantly your children had their, a male role model in the home. Yes. And this, that's worth more than any, this is worth Absolutely. more than gold. It really, really is. Mm-hmm. As long as you're a good man, which of course you want. Yes. You know, there are some fathers that you don't want them around your children. Right, exactly. That's a whole other issue. But what I could never understand is the man who doesn't think that he's supposed to financially support his kids. I don't get that. No. I'm not excusing it. It's trauma. It's a reason, yeah. It, it, you know, it, it's a trauma going on there, and we have to um, uh, still continue to hold them responsible. Absolutely. Accountable. And But I, I, I still don't, we leave out one thing that I think we go wrong there, and, and uh, I'm not accusing that, but when we get to the point where we get so frustrated, mothers, it's so frustrated, and likely so, we forget we don't have the time or we don't have the desire to communicate, to try to communicate with. And if they get the same way, that father gets to the point where they don't have the energy or the, the, mm-hmm. the spirit to even want to communicate. Or even around the children. 
Well, I can speak to that. I mean, because for, for us, it's like behavior. If you want to, if you're asking your ex about that and you already know how they are, then the past behavior is the, is going to be the predictor of future behavior. You just try to avoid it, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes you need like a mediator to take two people and try to figure it out. Like you were saying with them. Mm -hmm. No, it's difficult. It is very difficult. It, it is be. difficult, but I, I do think that both parents do need to share the responsibility financially. I don't care if you're giving yes. $5 a week. Yeah. Yes. That $5 will help to do something and be consistent with it. Um, exactly. but, but also given that time, you know, if you know, yeah. I don't, I don't say one or the other, I say you can, you can do both. It doesn't have to be yes. you giving, you know, $9,000, right. you can give but $10 and just give some time. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And I think a father should, or father or mother, should, whoever leaves the household with the other party, with the children should try to maintain the same standard of living that was going on before the other person left. Try to, you know, nobody wants the father of their kids, the mother of their kids to be destitute in the streets because they're no, paying absolutely. all of their money in child support. No, absolutely. nobody wants that. I hope. Yeah, no. Right. So, yeah, we got to do that. And, and, uh, and uh, but one more important, but we have, we don't have a choice anymore. We gotta rebuild our families. Family. We gotta bring that family back together. That's the foundation for any nation of people. You gotta we families how they broke us apart. Took our family unit away. We gotta bring yeah. that back. Yes. And we gotta do that. We gotta put aside our emotional part of it and think about our children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they yeah. hurt. They hurt. They hurt. When hurt. Doing, when parents are going back and forth about money here, or you're not doing this, you're not doing that. The kids hear that, yeah, and, and they and they're hurting, and that causes more trauma on them. It's a continued cycle. Absolutely, because they make it about themselves. Oh, this must mm -hmm. be my fault. They're arguing about me. Right, right. Well, I'm but also you. they learned um, how the wrong way to have a confrontation, and then they put that into their lives too, and then they perpetuate Absolutely. that. Yeah, yes. you know, and then the next thing you know, it becomes a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And so, parents, you know, this is why we really need to address this in our school systems with parents, parent teacher, parent groups rather, um, people like yourselves to help them to, you know, understand how what they do and say to each other affects their children's lives yes. now and forever mm -hmm. because it, it, it's the, they're developing into the kind of parents that we don't want them to be. Yeah. Because yeah. what you said earlier, the children are who they are because of who, what they see and what they hear. Absolutely. And you know, when we were growing up, you didn't see and hear all that because no. children were not around. They say this, you know, children were seen and not heard. Children were outside playing, doing whatever. They weren't sitting up there in, in front of their parents. Listen to you. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exactly. And, and now parents don't care what they say in front of their kids, especially oh, their kids. Yeah. <laughs> anything unfortunately yes so listen we have to wrap it up so the next um talent can come on so remember primal has everybody that you're looking for djs talk shows just keep continue to support us as we continue to grow and we appreciate you guys so much for coming on and can you come back and talk about child support with us again absolutely, absolutely. Thanks okay. for having us. they're requesting in the chat somebody said we need an hour on this so we'll, we'll have you back on in like a month or so, okay? Absolutely, absolutely. Please, All right. please. I appreciate that. Thank you guys so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having Bye. me. Absolutely. Yeah. Well. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good night, everyone. Good night, Good night now. Thanks again. Good night. <laughs>